Hello, church. I can remember the day well. I had an office in a church building just north of Detroit where we worked in the town of Rochester for about 10 years. Wonderful, wonderful memories. Still love that place and those people. But I walked into the office one day and something was just off. Something wasn't right. Just took a few moments to realize that the guitars that I had in my office, I had a couple of guitars and a ukulele, uh, the guitars were gone. The thieves had taken the guitars but left the ukulele, which hurt a little bit, but there it was. My first thought was, well, maybe they're not gone. Maybe they're being borrowed by the uh, the daycare that we held in one part of the building, or maybe there's a class going on somewhere. So I went about the building asking, and after a while it became very plain that they were gone. They just had been taken. Some of our, our friends said, well, we'll help you. We'll start looking at pawn shops. And like I said, don't, don't. And they asked why. And I said, well, there's going to come a time at the end of the world barbecue that those things are just going to be kindling. We don't need to be fighting over those things. And I get that attitude out of the reading for today, out of Second Peter chapter 3, that talks about the way that the world was destroyed by water and then renewed by God. And there'll be another time where it'll be destroyed by fire and then, knowing all of that, what should be our attitude toward all of these things? Not talking about guitars there so much, although it does really mean our, our attitude toward possessions, our attitude toward power or position, but it means actually just the way we look at life. This should adjust our attitude somehow. But then it ends with that really interesting verse. that We're going to take a look at a lot of verses that are interesting this week and next week. And they all have this same idea. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. In other words, in Second Peter chapter 3, just as after the flood, the earth is renewed, he sees a renewal of heaven and earth after the fire. We've talked a lot about hell and fire and all those words the last eight, let's see, seven weeks. But now we're going to talk about heaven. And when I was a kid, this was a simple subject. We, all, we knew where we were. We were in between. Heaven was somewhere well above us. God dwelt up there somewhere. And hell was down below us. And we didn't want to go down into hell. We wanted to go up into heaven. And then it got very complicated. Because the Bible is not as plain on all of these things as we would like. People decided they needed to graph all this out. Now back in the old days there was no video during sermons. And there was no PowerPoint screens. And instead they would take a bed sheet. I, a square one, not one of those that's fitted that nobody can fold, but a, but a square sheet. And they would draw an outline and chart and illustrations on it. And then they would string it up behind the, the, the minister. And he would whack it with a pointer stick when he was walking you through it. And so you still had heaven and you still had hell. But in the middle was this big round circle that was called uh, Hades or the place of the dead. And, and it was separated into paradise and there's Tartarus, and there's a great gulf. It got very complicated. And I always wondered, why does God have a place which is kind of heaven light and hell light, and then eventually pull us all out of there, and then tell us where we're going to go on judgment day? You already know where you're going to go because you're in hell light or heaven light. It was a very confusing thing. And some then said that we would all enter heaven at the same time and hell at the same time because that would make it fair, which didn't, again, resonate with me entirely. And our bodies would be resurrected then to fly up and meet with the souls wherever they had happened to be during that time. And then the earth would burn up and the universe would burn up and it would all be gone. But does that, is that what the Bible actually teaches? The Bible actually has quite a lot to say about our ultimate destination. But it doesn't use the language that we grew up with in our sermons, 
in our illustrations, in our Bible classes. We are never told. First time I heard this, I was thinking, no, 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 no. So I went on a search. Go ahead and go on the search if you'd like. We are never told that the goal of our life is to be good so that we can go to heaven. Never. Not once. We're never told, you be good and faithful unto death, and then you will ascend up into heaven. We're not told that. We're absolutely told to do good and to follow Jesus, that we might live with the Lord eternally, wherever he is and whatever he's doing, we would be living with him. We are invited into a present kingdom, a kingdom which is now, not necessarily now, then, later, but it is now. The kingdom of heaven is now. The kingdom of God is now. And we're invited to live and to, to take part in that kingdom, to play a vital role in that kingdom. He invites us to be co-laborers with Christ and with God himself in this present world so that, and this is a phrase we will hear in scripture frequently, all things may be reconciled to God. All things. How many things? All things may be recognized, uh, reconciled to God. In fact, most of the time, whenever the translators are being very precise in their language, it doesn't say all things may be. It says all things shall be. Now, in the English language, shall is more of an imperative word, which means it's absolutely going to happen. That's why King James translators used shall a lot in the, in the commandments. For example, thou shalt not murder, lutishma, meant murder will not happen. In other words, not, God didn't say you shouldn't murder. Or murder is bad. He said, it's not going to happen. That will not be tolerated. And so whenever the Bible says, all things shall be reconciled to God, it means it's going to happen. Period. The Bible refers to it so many times. Let's just take a look at some of them. Just to get us started. Next week we'll take a look at more. In Matthew chapter 19 verse 28, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, At the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The renewal of all things. Well, how about in Acts chapter 3? The church is brand new. In Acts chapter 2, it is inaugurated. There are baptisms. (coughs) The plan of salvation is given. It's a very exciting time. Acts chapter 3, verse 21. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed to you, even Jesus. Here it is. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything. As he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Everything restored. Everything renewed. Well, there's another R word in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Speaking of Christ and through him to reconcile, bring them back together. Something which has been broken. A relationship has been broken. Through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Just like in 2 Peter chapter 3, if you read it quickly and you don't pay attention, you don't see the connection to the flood and what God did after the flood to the destroyed earth. And you assume everything in the universe will be burned up. It'll be always gone without looking at that verse 13 that we saw that said, renewal of heaven and earth, reconciliation of heaven and earth here. It is, it's amazing once you start noticing these, They're everywhere. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. I'll do a little verse 9 too. He had made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment to bring unity 
to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. All things together. Paul uses the phrase tapanta, which means all things in heaven on earth. It is the exact same phrasing if we were to take a look at the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Created the heavens and the earth, tapanta. It's again, God will bring all of them together. He intends to bring everything back together to a state of good. The way it was when he made it. Think about that. Get the chills up and down your back. But there's more in Revelation chapter 21. And I put down verse 1. I'm actually going to read down through verse 3. Um, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And it all starts with a new heaven and a new earth because the things of the old heaven and the old earth have passed away. This is chapter 21 in Revelation. The culmination, the big wrap up of the wars between light and darkness. Darkness is now defeated and God brings a new heaven and a new earth to us. But we already saw that. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 13 said that as well. Isaiah looks for a healed world. A healed world in which we will live and in which we will praise our God. I'm going to read two verses. One is chapter 67 verse 17. The other is 66 verse 22. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. And in the next chapter, as the new heavens and new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. They will endure as long as God's new heaven and new earth endure. That's what we call eternity a word they did not have in their concepts at this time. But he envisions, Isaiah does, a healed world, free from sin, free from war, free from disease, as it's supposed to be when God declared all things good at creation. Now, rather than running away from a ruined earth, the Bible consistently tells us here, in the here and now, to redeem it, reclaim it, and return it to paradise. The word paradise, by the way, in scripture is the same word as garden. The Garden of Eden was not supposed to be an isolated outpost, but the way the world was supposed to be, the way the world was supposed to work. The Old Testament never places any substantial hope in an afterlife, and certainly not in an off-site afterlife. God's people, in fact, in the Old Testament, if you take a look, are called to be holy in the here and now, to redeem mundane, everyday matters, such as having children, tending the ground, caring for animals, seeking justice, and seeking peace. Now, I know a lot of these are new concepts for you. That's why we have Slido up there. This week and next week, the sermons are pre-recorded. But Slido is still open. You can, it's S-L-I-D-O, just like it sounds. It's a free app, super easy to use. Once it pops up, it'll ask you for a little password to come in, and it's just O-S-H-C for Our Safe Harbor Church. When I get back in town, then I'll be able to answer those questions. But ask them while they're fresh on your mind. Also, our, we, while I'm just taking a break here for a second, our hearts and prayers are with our brothers and sisters in Florida, another monster storm. We will continue to do all we possibly can to help them through 
One Gen Away and other groups that we know are run in a very lean, effective, powerful way. And don't worry, we can get the food to them. I know there have been roadblocks put up by bureaucrats in some places. We're able to get the food and supplies in through them. And so thanks uh, to One Generation Away, Chris and Elaine Whitney and their entire team. Coming back, in all these storms, if we look at the Old Testament, the way we are told to behave is not so that we can live forever in another place, but that we may bring holiness to the mundane, rescue the animals, clean up the debris, take water to a family, set up communications, whether it's Starlink or some other way, so that they can communicate with their families and tell them that they're fine or that they're not fine and that they need help. All of these things are holy things. Raising a child, changing a diaper, tending a garden, all of these are holy things in the Old Testament. Even how that you cared for your flocks, for your herds, the way you treated animals, all of these things were to be endowed by the holy. Contrast this to the teaching that was prevalent in Greece for about 400 years before the time of Jesus and still lingered on during the time of Christ, although not among the Jews, it must be said. Plato taught that this life is where this life is where you found glory, honor, success, and that death was a tragedy, and it sent you to the shadows of Hades. The only hope was to separate your soul from your earthly body and have the soul undergo a series of rebirths until you cleansed yourself of all bodily influences. There's a lot of Buddhist and Plato overlay here. <clears throat> then, once you had no more bodily influence, your soul would merge with the forms, capital F, the forms. The forms were transcendent, suprasensory, timeless realms of ideas. Or, as Plato would call it, you would just be absorbed into pure thought. You would become logic, dialectic, debate. Over the centuries, just as they did with the concepts of hell and death, Plato's ideas about the soul and, the, and its future had a great impact on early Christians. Neoplatonism entered in and has stayed with real consequences. Augustine imported it hook, line, and sinker, as they say in America, all of it. As Bachman and Hart summarized it in their 1999 book, Hope Against Hope, they say, quote, the Christian hope has constantly been understood as hope for human fulfillment in another world, heaven, rather than as hope for the eternal future of this world in which we live. So, what's the... What's the consequence of that? What's the result of that doctrine? We told the poor that they were going to be rich in heaven. We told the slaves that they'd be free in heaven. We told those unjustly prisoned or victimized by neighbors or governments that all would be fine in the sweet by and by. We felt comfortable not confronting injustice or evil because those who suffered will be just fine later. God will balance the books later. But there's no equivalent to that teaching in Scripture. None. Here, we are told to be active in redeeming our earth. That was our original job, if you remember. We're not called to storm the castle, to quote the Princess Bride. We're not told to overthrow a government. We are called to love and serve where we are with what we have to whomever is near us. Whatever situation we can change, we have been called to redeem that, to reconcile that, to unify that, to bring it back to God, to bring it back to good. Years ago, a church where I served, the leaders wanted us to go through Rick Warren's book, uh, A Purpose Driven Life. It was a fine book, and it had an awful lot of good in it. But there was one teaching that did not match what Scripture tells us. 
we could quibble about others, but the one I want to talk about now. Are we here? Were we created for the purpose of worshiping God? Now, according to some major denominations in this world, the only purpose we were created, it's in their catechism, it's in the purpose-driven life, was to praise and worship God. Is that, is that true, though? Is that it? Is that our job? No. God actually tells us our job twice in both creation stories, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So he created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. That's your job. By the way, to rule over it doesn't mean plow the mountains down and strip mine them and leave them toxic for the rest of time. It doesn't mean to, to not treat the earth as important. It's the opposite, actually. The words here to rule over are the same words given to Adam that are often translated to tend the garden, to keep the garden. And then he repeats it in chapter 2. The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The Psalms say this to us as well. Psalm 8, one of the favorite Psalms of, of Christianity and Judaism in verses 6 through 8 of Psalm 8, you have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the sea. It's our job. It is who we are. It's what we are to do. Our fundamental task is the responsible use of power on God's behalf over our earthly environment. You are not wasting your time when you create a garden or a thing of beauty. You're not wasting your time when you clean up a river or pick up litter along a road. While this is not our only job, it is our primary task. It is the primary task of human beings. Bring order and beauty back to the earth. Art, agriculture, and animal husbandry all star in the Old Testament as works we do unto the Lord and on his behalf. Do yourself a real favor this week. Read the entirety of Psalm 104. I'm not going to read it here because it is not, not one of the longer psalms, but it's longer than we generally do for reading. But Psalm 104, read that and absorb the constant admonition from God to bring beauty to the earth. We lived in the United Kingdom for, for quite a while, and uh, it still holds a de very dear place in my heart and my heritage, of course, of my family. But one of the heartbreaking things was to see those beautiful buildings that used to be built in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, and then Somewhere in the 1900s, in the 60s and 70s, the idea of brutalism came in. And that's actually an architectural term. Brutalism. Stark, pebble-dashed, concrete, ugly blocks that deteriorated quickly. And instead of all these beautiful homes, tear down the homes, stuff people in these towers, it'll be better. And it was horrible. And you see the brutalism right by the beauty, and you wonder... Why can't we build these things anymore? It's not just the United Kingdom. You could say this in any American city. You can walk around and say, well, look at this. This was beautiful. Why don't we do this anymore? Well, somehow, we have forgotten that it is our task to do things of beauty. I can remember 
seen a door on the cathedral at Cologne where, and I don't remember because I was, I was a teenager at the time when I was there, but the guide talked about one generation of family had spent their entire lives carving this one door. And a person with me who was part of the religious group that I was a member of at the time said, think about that, wasting your entire life just carving a door when God wants you to go out there and make disciples. It wasn't for years later until I understood in the Bible Making that door is an acceptable worship. As long as you're also loving God and loving your neighbor, sharing, being generous, being kind, being a, an embodiment of heaven where you are, you're making something beautiful for God. You're making something beautiful for your community. Something beautiful, that, such as at Cologne. Hundreds of years later, we can come and see the beauty dedicated to the worship of Almighty God. And then you go into other countries where they have a caste system of where it's not my job to pick up the trash. I'm too important to pick up the trash. And the poor people are overwhelmed by the trash and there's no place to put the trash. And mounds of trash are everywhere. And holy rivers that they even worship, such as the river Ganges. I can remember well, uh, a, a few young men decided to, to sail the entire Gang Ganges the holy, holiest river in India. And they had to abandon after just a few days because of the smell of sewage, the dead bodies, and the garbage in the river. That is not an acceptable worship to God. Bring beauty. Bring order. Bring art. Bring color. If you don't, we end up with trash and decay. And far too many of us are far too comfortable with trash and decay. I happen to be married to a woman who has very precise and orderly ways of doing things. And although we kid her about being OCD, she's not really OCD. She just believes in bringing the beauty of God to everything she can do. So yes, the way the house is organized, you don't see trash, you don't see piles Whenever the plate is presented at dinner, and she does the cooking, not because we're sexist, but because she would like for the food to be edible, and I can't pull that off, the plate looks beautiful. The food on the plate is arranged beautifully, and she can't not do that. We were only married for uh, a few months, I believe it was, when my father first came to visit us, and some of my other family came to visit us as well. And we were very, very poor, but that was fine. We offered the best we could. And I remember overhearing my father turning to one of my other family members and said, when you come to Patrick and Cammie's place, maybe all you'll get is a bologna sandwich, but it will be the most beautifully presented bologna sandwich that you will ever see. She is offering her acceptable worship. She's doing what God charged Adam and Eve to do in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and which is celebrated throughout the Old Testament and even in the New, but we tend to miss it. Only humans are given this task. It is our job. The reason I am not physically present at the sound stage when you are watching this is because I will be with prisoners in Louisiana State Penitentiary on one of the very few opportunities during the year where you get to visit with more than one. And therefore, it was important enough for me to be there. And what are they doing? It is a rodeo, but I've never actually walked into the rodeo or seen an event. I stay on the outside where about 80% of the, the, the prisoners stay, and they bring art. And you can buy their art, and it's paintings. But it's also woodwork, which is astounding, leather work, Iron work, wrought iron work, all kinds of, you know, there's everything from furniture to, um, to decorations, and it's beautiful. They are creating beauty even while they live in ashes. And it's something which our safe harbor wants to encourage. And so I know that one of the people that's going to be with me this on the Sunday that you're watching this has actually pre prearranged to buy some of the prisoner art. Because the fact is, if you do buy it on site, 
then the state takes, I believe, it's a 25% cut. Uh, it's just another moneymaker. Uh, all prisons are like that. Louisiana's not unique in that. We go to celebrate the beauty that they can create even where they are. In fact, if you come to visit the soundstage when you walk in, one of the first things you'll see is a big, big piece of art done by one of our brothers who's on death row. It's a beautiful thing. There's art, if you come down to where we worship, you will see sitting there where the communion is, is a beautiful uh, little turntable, I believe in America you call it a lazy Susan, that with our logo and everything else, a brother of ours in Indiana made just for us. And we're thrilled because it's a thing of beauty, and that's what humans do. But here's the thing, while we're the only ones given that specific job in Scripture, all creation worships God. Another psalm for you to read this week, much shorter, and we sing it. When we sing hallelujah, praise Jehovah, they work a lot of Psalm 148 into those verses. All creation worships God. How does, for example, a mountain or a lake worship God? By being a mountain. By being a lake. By being a tree, by being a star. And what do you mean worship? Well, how do we worship? We worship by being humans in the full glory of what that means. Don't ever say to anybody, well, I'm just human. Are you kidding me? Human means you were made in the image of God, that you were made just a little lower than the angels, that you were assigned a task of interacting with this earth using what God gave us to transform our earthly environment into something that glorifies our God. So why is this our job? Because God gave it to us and because God introduced himself to us as a God of order. When Genesis was written, the predominant creation story was a Babylonian Enuma Elish. It taught that the universe was created by combat between two gods, Marduk and Tiamat and Tiamat was defeated and his body became the cosmos and Marduk rules over it and according to the Enuma Elish that's why we have to obey our kings on earth because they are they are following King Marduk who ruled over the chaos but God gives us a different story his universe is not created out of violence and it doesn't have violence as its justification for existence Instead, he creates a universe and declares it good at each and every step. And then he creates man and woman, and wait for it, God then partners with them to continue to care for and manage the garden of creation. No other God or king has ever offered to partner with their subjects, but this God, Yahweh, our God, does. Genesis chapters 1 and 2 were shocking in their day. The introduction of a radically different kind of God. And that God would be revealed in nature. Romans 1. What we can know about God, we can see in those things he created. And it was also revealed in the person of our son, our, uh, his son, our savior, our Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Lord. And God said, through him and with us, he would restore all things in heaven and in earth. More about that next week.